Um, so welcome. It's so great to see everybody. It's always wonderful to see you. Um, a nice way to kind of start my week off. I can't believe it's already Tuesday. Um, for those of you who enjoy Magic the Gathering, I hope you've been enjoying the Kamigawa block also. I know I have, so that's been a, a guilty pleasure of mine this past week um, and weekend. Um, so anyways, today we're moving into our week on games and representation, out of our week on games and power, into our week on games and representation. And I'm really, really glad to host Ed, Edmund Chang, who is a dear colleague of mine, a wonderful peer, and someone who's been writing about representation and games for the better half of this past decade, before it was cool. Um, so uh, that, that's the way I like to see it. Um, I was first introduced um, to Ed, Edmund's work um, at uh, the Popular oh, yeah. Culture Association work conference, uh, uh, where um, uh, Ed was in a video call talking about queer games. So I didn't get to meet Ed then, but I really liked his talk there. And he's written like on like Cards Against Humanity and Queerness. He was one of the first people studying games and queerness. So just a really wonderful person to meet and speak to. And I'm really glad to have him with us today. So um, that's it. Uh, Ed, the, the floor is yours. Usually folks take about an hour and they talk about whatever they want. They, they jump in and out of Q&A. The group is really chatty. And we're just really happy to have you here laying some, uh, some knowledge on all of us. Great, thank you so much. Um, I will strongly encourage everyone to, I have chat open uh, or you can jump and uh, on voice and, and you know raise a hand, whatever, and I'll do my best to pay attention or uh, uh, Aaron, you can uh, help uh, moderate and do good stuff. Um, uh, good afternoon to you all. I still see that it's kind of uh, sunny. Is it still sunny there? Maybe. Um, it's been a rainy day, which was, uh, which has been, I guess, the equivalent of a sunny day in other parts of the world for us. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I'm in on the East Coast, so it's uh, pitch black outside right now. Um, and uh, just to make you all feel a little better, it is currently uh, 32 degrees. So, um, <laughs> but not expecting any snow. So, you know, it's still cold out here. Uh, I just want to introduce myself a little bit, uh, uh, just to sort of follow up with um, uh, with Aaron. What Aaron said, you're welcome to call me Ed or Dr. Chang or Hey You. Uh, totally fine. I answer to all pronouns, so you know that's also totally fine. Um, uh, I'm currently an assistant professor of English at uh, Ohio University, which, if you are not familiar with the geography of Ohio, it is in the southeast corner of Ohio. Uh, the nearest large city is Columbus. Um, I teach primarily uh, 20th, 21st century literature, uh, but I have um, uh, taken on the extra special role of being the guy that always teaches the weird classes. So I do teach, uh, when I get a chance, classes on game studies. Uh, I teach a lot of um, ethnic American lit, uh, science fiction, fantasy, speculative lit, popular culture, uh, all that good stuff. So, uh, and then mixed in that, uh, if I get a chance, uh, I do also queer theory, queer literature, that sort of stuff. So um, my interests run the gamut. Um, so I guess, you know, looking at the topic for today, rethinking representation and role playing, I figure we do a little, I know there's a lot of you, but we'll do a little bit of a kind of like uh, word association, brainstorming, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, you can close your eyes if you want to, but I just want to, so some of you may be gamers, some of you may not be, some of, me, some of you may play video games or tabletop games or board games, or uh, you can even think back to when you were younger and you were playing pretend with your siblings or neighbors, wherever, just pick a sort of scenario where you had to take on a character or to pretend to be something. It could even be, you know, on the stage. Um, and think about, you know, the, the characters that you tend to like to play or characters that you gravitate to, or uh, so we can talk about Dungeons and Dragons archetypes, we can talk about, um, you know, personality types, whatever you'd like. Uh, and, you know, just right now, just sort of think about, you know, what kind of your favorite character or a character that sort of comes to mind. Um, think about how they're dressed, think about like what kind of food they like to eat. Uh, think about like what kind of weapons they prefer or use. Think about if they have a catchphrase or a signature move. 
um, think about like what kinds of people tend to you know be around them or who they make friends with. And as you're thinking about all of these things, um, I'm being uh, purposefully circuitous because now I want you to think about what they look like, um, and you know, uh, down to like what their hair is like, uh, how light or dark their skin is, um, what their gender presentation is, all those sorts of things, um, and just you know, think about if that jives with or somehow doesn't jive with maybe uh, your own life or uh, your, the expectations of what you should play. And I, I start here because I was thinking about my own gaming experiences and thinking about the kinds of characters I play. And I read the uh, Antero Garcia article and I was thinking back to my Dungeons and Dragons days. Um, yes, I played uh, second edition, uh, you know, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Um, which I still consider to be the best, uh, <laughs> mainly because I'm a rules wonk. But um, but I think about the characters that I played the most. Uh, I had two characters I played. Um, I dual charactered for a little while, and uh, I played a mage and I played a cleric. Uh, and when it gets down to brass tacks, and we had to sort of describe ourselves. Um, I never imagined either character is not being white. And that's something I didn't really sort of put two or two, two and two together until much later in my life. Um, and uh, especially now as an academic of games and, and representation and popular culture and these things, um, you know, my 17 year old self um, was really just sort of just bought in lock, stock, and barrel to all of the genre conventions that come along with fantasy or science fiction or Dungeons and Dragons. And so um, maybe if anyone wants to share just a little bit briefly, you can chat, uh, tell me a little bit about like, is there a sort of like, you know, there's this term called ludonarrative dissonance. I don't know if you've talked about that at all, but there is this idea that, you know, when you play a game, there is something happening as you play that always reminds you that you're playing a game, but also reminds you or asks you to try to sort of buy in to think about this in terms of it being a narrative or a seamless world or, or whatever. And I feel like this is a moment where the narrative you construct in your mind may not be this narrative that's actually happening in the real world. So what do people think or anything stand out to you when I ask you on this little mind palace journey? Aaron, you want to moderate or you know your people better or should I just call on people? I, I usually um, put them into a queue as they come up. So oh, okay, it, great. They'll go left okay. right. But um, yeah, I, I would I would let you because it, it tends to be pretty chatty. So oh, uh, great. So if they're so just in the order on my screen, right? So yeah. Daniel. Oh, uh, yes. The person that would come to mind when we talk about little narrative dissonance is like, how a lot of games, particularly between like 2008 and 2015, have like this morality system that tends to be very like black and white, where it's like there's a good and an evil. Mm -hmm. Like Fallout um, has this, um, like Infinite Second Son. Um, there are a lot of games within that period of time where it's like there is a good and a bad, but this narrative doesn't actually change that much. Right. Whether or not you do like a good or evil action, so you may just choose to do all the evil actions, but within the context of the story, you're still portrayed as like the hero. Right. Um, even though it doesn't really feel like you are doing that, or you're purposely choosing to play in a way that is more like chaotic or evil. Yeah. Yeah. And that you know, you would think that the world would change or react to the fact that you are, you know, being horrible or doing something sort of shady. I mean, it doesn't even have to have a sort of morality system. I think about some of the more kind of open world games like the early um, Elder Scrolls games where you could basically run in and rob everyone blind and murder a whole village. And 
yes, there would be repercussions, but at some point the game just stopped caring or you became so powerful that it didn't really matter, right? That you could just sort of uh, do whatever you wanted. Awesome, Erin. Um, in terms of like the kind of uh, like imagine what characters are just generally like what kind of characters you tend to play. Um, I think that usually my characters are Asian um, just because I am Asian. So it's kind of easiest for me to kind of sink into that. But in retrospect, I also think that the times that I've played like one shots where it's been more like jokey or like, oh, I'm going to play like something that isn't actually something I'm putting a lot of thought into tends to be a white character um, just by like, I don't know. I feel like if you look at D&D Beyond, for example, and like all the PHB races, mm -hmm. the non-magical ones and the monstrous ones are to, I was like looking at this because we were um, reading our articles. Um, all the only ones that aren't white uh, in terms of PHB are ones with monstrous blood or the human, which is like kind of, boring in terms of like like the actual magical races are all white so I think that kind of makes me subconsciously think that if I decide to play a character then it kind of should be exactly how the book has written it in a way yeah and we can talk I mean I'm gonna get into the you know granddaddy of example <laughs> I'm sure you're going to expect, uh, you know, the T word or the T name to, to show up at some point in our conversation, but, uh, but that's great. Um, and even if, even if you don't describe your character in a certain way, you know, I think when we think about like what things default to, um, that itself is its own kind of like problem or, you know, color blindness or whatever. That's great. Awesome. Chris. Yeah, uh, I was also thinking about characters I've played and I was thinking about it. I don't think I really have anything I lean into a lot. My, uh, I, I am a rare example of having a group that has made a lot of like smaller campaigns. So we've made a lot of characters, but I'm always trying something different, hmm. whether it's like the race class, even weapon choices. I like to try to do weird things with it sometimes, uh, which is very interesting because I, I, I was thinking because as a in real life, I tend to be kind of a creature of habit. I tend to not stray far from the things I usually do. So I think it's interesting that with D&D, it's the place where I have um, kind of branched out. Right. Um, well, and then um, appearance, go ahead, keep going, sorry. Uh, appearance wise too, um, I guess I do it a little differently where my group will find art we like to base our characters off of first. Uh, and uh, a lot of fantasy art does tend to be more, you know, uh, Eurocentric, but I, I do try to make the conscious effort to not just save art of, uh, of white characters because I do want to try to try to, I don't know, something about it. It's like, I like to, I like to try to have, uh, I guess, diversity among my own characters, which is kind of sure. feels a little odd to say, but even like gender and sexual orientation, I tend to play around with, with characters, even though, again, not something I really do in real life. So I don't know. Right. Well, as I, what I was going to say earlier was that, you know, one of the things about games, let's, and we can keep this to like tabletop games or, or even, even computer games or live action role playing games, right? Like games to a certain degree give you permission to play with those sort of things that you don't necessarily, I mean, you know, I'm never going to wake up the, tomorrow and be, you know, a six foot nine barbarian, right? Like that's not going to happen. Um, but um, so that imaginative world, I think, is really powerful. Now, the difficulty, of course, is that when that imaginative world crashes headlong into very real world things like the way identity works or the way that um, uh, certain kinds of representation work and things like that. So we're going to bracket one of the side, sort of side questions where, you know, what if your character isn't you or doesn't look like you, 
or you know another way of saying that is like do people expect that your characters will always look like you or not look like you and then what happens when you play a character in a fantasy game that is signaling something that you are not and does that risk for example brown face or yellow face or a black face or those sorts of things um, I think in a tabletop setting, it's much more, it's much easier to just leave that kind of in the theater of the mind. But I think about, you know, I play LARP, I've designed a LARP myself. And, you know, when you play live action and people are actually dressing up um, and trying to, you know, embody their characters, or even if you're playing, you know, cosplaying or something like that, you know, we, there's a story at least once a year, if not multiple times a year where people are like, you know, stop putting on blackface or stop dressing in this way um, because you know this is this is where fantasy and reality sort of collide right uh great kyle uh hi um so one of the things that um which was kind of like touching on the thing that you brought up about like you know whenever we do step into a um persona that isn't our own or something that isn't usual so like something that's uh varied from the way that we are in a sense so like you know stepping into different races different genders uh, otherwise um like the, the okay so the thing I wanted to bring up is like when you ask the question of like what do we think of I thought of my personal characters and then I began to like compare them to the characters that I played whenever I'm like DMing and something like that or if I'm writing a story for like a like my personal stuff um and then I realized like there is kind of a habit that I have where because I like to put myself into like every single character that I play at least a little bit but it becomes difficult whenever I'm having to like look into a different like for like the, one of the hardest things for me to role play and like D and D and stuff is like playing the opposite gender mm -hmm. for me personally. So like um, whenever I play female characters in as a DM, it's incredibly difficult for me to like okay, so how do I become this person without relying heavily on stereotype, and how do I like present them as a person as opposed to present them as here's a list of things that I know about this thing that they're that usually people of this nature act like, which um, to me was kind of an interesting topic that I like. It, it, it kind of like made me realize that I do that a lot of like, I have to catch myself on certain things if I'm playing as something that isn't myself as, as to avoid becoming, you know, offensive or, you know, um, saying something that's going to be taken the wrong way and right. potentially re uh, represent somebody in, in an incorrect way, which right. is, I don't know, it's interesting whenever you compare like your comfort zone and what you default, default to and then like the thought processes that are required to step out of that, in my opinion. That's great. And I'm going to bracket another question that we'll get to. So I'll just get through these comments and then I'll bring up some things that maybe we can think about and talk about. Um, uh, Matthew. Um, well, first going off with like the kind of characters I usually play, I actually usually tend to play um, non-human um, non characters like uh, Dragonborn, um, uh, uh, Khajiit and Skyrim and games like that um, and even a lot of my favorite characters like from video games all the NPCs and stuff they're usually more non-human and for um, uh, like sexual orientation it varies from very widely for all the characters as well which I think kind of relates to me in some way but one thing that um, you were talking about the Ludo dissonance that I thought of was actually not in relation to games, but more in relation to literature. Okay. Because I remember at one point I, when I was younger, I was reading a book and I decided to start focusing on this character's, uh, in the character image I had in my head of the main character. And I realized that he had my face, which sounds <laughs> really weird. But I, it, I then realized that I had that when the book isn't describing the characters, my brain defaults to its own thought of what the characters are, regardless of the descriptions. It creates its own um, image of those characters based on how they act. And usually the main characters, if they're male, um, tend to have some sort of my face in it. Mm. It really, like threw me off when I first realized it and it still a lot of times breaks um the immersion I have when reading when I like all of a sudden realize that like when I'm imagining the characters doing various actions right right that's interesting 
Um, I don't know what that says about you, but uh, <laughs> not, uh, but I think it's really interesting to see, think about whether or not we project ourselves into uh, the things that we play or we read, and do we see ourselves as you know embodying the protagonist, right? So. Um, I think obviously we can think of situations where that may be more or less difficult depending on, you know, if, if the configurations of identities and embodiments are closer to your own or further away from your own. Um, and uh, that, you know, that's very, really interesting. We'll talk about that more a little bit. Uh, Ed. Hello, can you hear me? Awesome. Uh, I had more of just a general question. So in a game, whether that be a video game, RPG, anything like that, where you are trying to build a diverse group of people, like in a modern city or something like that, what is one way that you can implement that kind of diversity or multiculturalism without, um, especially if you don't belong to some of the groups that you're trying to include, without, as Kai was saying, maybe resulting to stereotyping or just misrepresenting them overall? Yeah, I think that's a really challenging question. Um, I'm gonna hold off on say, talking about that. And can I just put that to maybe towards the end, and we can talk totally. about questions? Maybe yeah, of course. Questions can come up. Um, I think the short answer is, you know, do your is the short answer is always do your work, and whatever mm -hmm. that means, that usually means like um, either bringing in people to, you know, actually, you know, help you build that stuff out, or making sure that you know what you're trying to do is not. Um, is, is, you know, this is the problem with kind of like what people were talking about earlier about, you know, presenting a world that is authentic in a certain way. And this matters more perhaps in a setting that is like set in the real world, you know, as opposed to a setting that's set in, you know, a some fan, you know, fantasy, you know, imagined world. And we can talk about the differences between those two things. I'll tell you a little bit about the games I've designed and some of the sort of philosophies behind it. And maybe that will help sort of get to some of those answers. Totally. Uh, but that's Thank a great you. question. Awesome. Eric. Um, well, uh, is it too early to bring in the T word or? Oh, go for it. it... Yes. You're okay. the, so. The yeah okay well uh i well this is more geared towards the professor but i wrote this week's journal specifically about tolkien's influence in D, &D and how like yeah the uh basically the default assumption that uh human equals white male just basically comes from tolkien and how like uh what is it there's a reason why like elves and dwarves and humans are like all assumed to be white and uh especially this becomes apparent in dnd like non-white races essentially being uh represented as uh, non-human races i think uh more modern titles say like warcraft uh kind of reflect this a lot where like you know the yeah, number, the 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 yeah, Toran yeah, or like uh, Native America or like how the trolls are like very clearly uh, well, like you know what is it like yeah, Caribbean yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Caribbean influence etc so, yeah. and uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess my question is like do you think that uh, Western yeah, fantasy in general can ever escape Tolkien's influence like is it even possible for a uh, fantasy genre in general to like ever escape uh, Tolkien's harmful rhetoric about uh, you know bioessentialism uh, white supremacy and such that's also a really great uh, question and a really difficult one. People are working on that all the time. The answer, the short answer is yes, because people are already doing it, right? So you have writers, particularly, um, most notably, uh, Black women fantasy writers like N.K. Jemison or uh, Nisi Shaw or um, uh, my brain has just flew out of my head, uh, Neil Hopkinson, um, who are all in this sort of long tradition of writers that sort of like, you know, uh, Octavia Butler, who unfortunately is no longer with us, 
like are trying to sort of rewrite fantasy from a very different sort of perspective. So uh, folks like uh, Nadia Okorafor or N.K. Jemison are talking about like, what would fantasy look like if it were based in from, you know, uh, an African continental sort of perspective, what would that look like? Um, as opposed to, you know, um, uh, the, the Western European sort of model. Um, I'm going to give Tolkien a teeny little bit of slack because he is drawing on mythological and, and literary traditions that were long established well, way before him. Uh, so think about like the Arthurian romance or, um, you know, Finnish uh, mythology or whatever that obviously foregrounds particular kinds of bodies and, uh, and attitudes towards the other, whether they're, you know, from the distant icy north or from the, you know, what we would now call the Middle East or the Far East. And so, you know, all of that stuff is just sort of being, you know, hoovered up into, um, into his writing. And then everybody else is just also sort of absorbing this as well. And so, I think, you know, going back to the earlier question about like, how do we do that? Uh, how do we fix this or how do we address this? I think it is about trying to sort of think about ways to um, not necessarily, you know, throw the baby out, uh, you know, out with the bathwater, but just sort of decenter certain things and then recenter other things uh, as well. Um, so this gets me to some things that came up in the discussion. And I want to talk a little bit about this. And this may be um, I don't think it's controversial, but I think it's something that that you know uh, it very clearly produces sides. And uh, in my own sort of research and writing, um, I really, really sort of try to combat or 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 at least challenge or put pins in this notion of immersion, right? Uh, or this notion of um, um, you've probably all talked about the magic circle at least in, at some point. Um, this idea that games are somehow, you know, not the real world, uh, and there is a sort of permeable barrier between the game and the real world um, that allows the space of the game to be safe to play, right? Because if you don't feel like, you know, you're safe, then you're not going to, you know, do things that you would normally, you know, or you would want to act out or whatever. Um, and a lot of writers have written that, you know, the magic circle is, is actually really shot through, you know, it has holes in it. And especially because players do import their own sort of norms, biases, attitudes, you know, uh, uh, predilections, fantasies into the game, just like um, Garcia says, when uh, people talk about playing Dungeons and Dragons, when you, when you sit down to play your character or create a character or create a world, you're creating it out of something and that that is you know what's in your head or in your experience um and so i think when we talk about i think a number of people talked about like you know when i play a character i want to make sure that um especially if i'm playing you know cross gender or if i'm playing even sort of cross race or cross you know fantasy cultures whatever that i want to do that in a way that isn't too stereotypical or whatever and i wonder if we want that level of immersion, right? So in LARP theory, there's this idea of bleed, which is like, you know, the real world shouldn't bleed into the game world uh, and vice versa, obviously. And so, um, you know, I try to be as theatrical as possible when I GM or when I play my characters as a, as a, as a gamer, as a player myself, but I don't necessarily try to inhabit my character like I'm in a play, right? Like I'm I'm doing sort of this sort of um, attempt at verisimilitude or realism for lack of a better word. And I think that's where I think we can get into sort of trouble, right? So this is why people are like, well, I'm gonna play a drow and therefore I have to put black paint on my face because that's the way, that's the, that's the immersive way of doing it, right? Um, and so I wonder if we can think about games that you know, games are already pretend, why are we trying to push them toward reality, right? Or, or why is that more valuable than creating other modes of play or, or you know, ways of signaling that I'm doing X, Y, and Z, um, as opposed to like, I have to, you know, a serious gamer is one that inhabits their character fully and never breaks character and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, 
Um, any thoughts about that or what do folks think? Oh, Aaron. Um, I think that in terms of like playing, it's a lot of the time the DM's job to kind of handle like just what is okay at the table in general, right? Uh -huh. So if we went with like the draw example um, and say there was a player who was a person of color, that would definitely get them out of the mood of playing, right? Like that would be in turn something that would make the game itself less playable for everyone so if the argument is to support like hey i'm gonna do this really bad thing because it puts me in character then it'll put other people out of character and also just generally if you need to do that to be in character then you're not a good player like that shouldn't be what makes you that shouldn't be what gets you into the into the character if that's what you need Hmm. At least in my opinion. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's what I'm saying is that, you know, I think that's, I mean, there, there, there's, you know, there are role playing guides and, you know, YouTube videos and like all this sort of stuff, right? That where we're like, okay, like, where do we draw the line between playing and, and this attempt at, again, I don't know what to call it, like, again, verisimilitude is the word that comes to mind. So if you, you know, watch, like, you know, if you watch live plays now, so, you know, the critical, like critical role is super popular and is this like massive, you know, media machine now. And people love it so much because these are actual actors, right? They're voice actors, but they're also actor actors. Um, and they're not, you know, putting themselves into necessarily like full costume, makeup, all that sort of stuff. But part of the pleasure is that, we like, you know, seeing people sort of really fully as fully as possible inhabit these roles. Um, but not everyone wants to do that. Not everyone can do that. Um, and, you know, obviously one of the sort of deep, you know, one of the main critiques of critical role is that we don't see a lot of players of, care, of color, right? Um, we see a lot of other gender and, and queer representation, but, you know, that's something that's really difficult. And it's, I guarantee you, it's very clear that the player characters that are there are not going to be like, I'm going to play a character, of a human of color, right? Because that would be a bridge too far. They would get super canceled really fast, right? Um, but fantasy races allow us to get around that. You know, if I'm blue, then it doesn't matter. But, you know, my argument is that that fantasy race is just race. <laughs> Right, it really is just race, and in fact, when characters are designed, so the World of Warcraft example is really great. There's a, a game scholar named Alexander Galloway who asked this famous question many, many years ago: Why do trolls in World of Warcraft speak with a Jamaican accent? And the answer is really simple: It's because we want to make these these creatures, characters, different than the than the humans and different than the Alliance, then different than X, Y, and Z. And therefore we're gonna draw on all of these shorthands that are based in problematic racist logics, right? So they are trolls, they speak with this accent, they live on sandy beaches and huts and practice voodoo and cannibalism. And you suddenly have this litany of like the description of the West Indies from like the 1800s, right? Um, by by white clone colonists being like, oh, these people are, you know, uh, out of their minds. And so I think that's the tension is that idea of like, we're playing, but for some people, it's never going to be play. And so the example that you gave was like, if you play in a certain way that really, you know, trigger someone's, you know, uh, uh, certain identities or positionalities, like that's never going to be play for them. So, you know, whenever I watch something or see something and someone leans a little too far into the kind of like, you know, Asian stereotype or, you know, the yellow, I, I just watched Dune, the new one, the other, you know, week a while ago. And, um, and when Dr. Yue, right, 
suddenly speaks Mandarin. I was like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> that was and, awful. That was awful. Um, I'm so sorry. I had the same reaction. And the reason I had that problem was because I was like, wait, is this distant Earth? Okay, I get that. But then suddenly I was like, oh, he's Asian. He speaks Mandarin. He's the betrayer, the traitor. I was like, what is this yellow peril BS, right? What is happening here? And so that for me is when I'm like, that pulls me straight out of the immersion, right? And so that's what I'm trying to get at is sometimes, you know, we, we need to think about like, you know, maybe it's not about accurate representation, but about just representation or, or, um, or representation that doesn't rely on the shorthands that we are so used to or thinking about that. I know there's a tons of hands, but I'm on a roll. Um, so I just wanted to say really quickly, the two games I've designed and the covers are behind me. So Archaea is, wait, I'm a bad YouTuber. Archaea is my live action role-playing game and Tellings uh, is my tabletop role-playing game. And um, I designed both to be human worlds. Uh, and mainly because I was like, not that there aren't demi-humans or monsters or, you know, whatever, all sorts of creatures and things like that. But I was like, you know, why are we playing dwarves, elves, you know, uh, kobolds, whatever? They're basically all just analogs for real world race anyway. And so why don't we think about what that actually means in the world? Now, what's really interesting is both of these games I wrote in the 90s, um, and I just rewrote them or just revised them in 2018, 2017 and 18. And I will say I would, I now that I'm a professor and, you know, many, many years later, I was like, I would have made these games in a very different way. Um, but I didn't want to change the source material too much because then it would be a totally different game. But I, in other words, I went through both games and kind of blunted some of the kind of language that we would see in Dungeons and Dragons about like these people are vaguely like they're from, you know, Imperial China or these people or, you know, that sort of stuff, which isn't, that's an interesting thing to sort of have to face in my own kind of, you know, creation and recognizing that as a person of color, I've just absorbed all of these sort of norms and tropes and, and such. Um, Kyle. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, uh, two things. One thing I did want to say that um, Aaron's point about like, you know, um, sometimes stepping too far in order to make a funny joke about something can often like cause um, traumas to show up. Like this happened like recently in my um, game that I put with my friends online. And I was, it, it reminded me of like how, how easy it is to forget like where the boundary is and what it is that breaks the circle. Um, like in the example, basically, uh, one of our players is uh, transgender and the character that the DM was playing misgendered them. And it wasn't mm -hmm. like, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't to like physically get or, or to like emotionally get at, at the person. It was right. to show that the character was stupid, not to show right. that, the, you know, not to be offensive, but to show that they were stupid, but they didn't realize that it crossed that line and it became a, a, a topic of interest. Um, and the other thing you had mentioned like critical role and how, you know, like basically the entire cast of critical role at this point is mainly white men, but it's still a good show. And mm -hmm. like, the thing I was gonna bring up is um, they made their uh, animated uh, show that came out recently. Yeah. And an interesting topic that came up when they were picking voices for that is like the, the dungeon master, Matt Mercer, he's like a white male, but he has two like incredibly loved NPCs, both of which are people, uh, uh, people of color, uh, pe uh, people of color, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and in the selection process, I believe they gave both of those roles to other voice actors who were also people of color. And in my head, I was like, obviously that's the, that's like the correct move for like a lot of reasons. Um, and to me, it was interesting because whenever I, he played those characters, like during the live shows, it never felt like he was relying on race and sort of like what right. you were mentioning. It was, let's not um, represent, or, or some, what was the phrase you said exactly, where it was like, let's represent these races, but not have to like go into depth as like, um, oh, I can't remember the exact phrase that you use, I'm so sorry. Um, but something about like, lungs of like representing characters without needing to use their race as a reason to represent them. Like let's put them into characters and have them just be cool, be the, like, like be fantasy, which I think is an interesting um, 
like concept in terms of writing for me. Uh, yeah, so I, I will, I'm just going to speak. I think that's great. And I think that's really important. I think that's a very white creator thing to say, because I think what it means is I can't center race in the ways that perhaps a, a, a creator of color can. And therefore, I need to sort of step back, which I think is is a, an important thing. But that to me, you know, might tip too suddenly far into sort of colorblind logics, right? Which is like, this character is cool. They happen to be brown or Asian or whatever. And so we need to figure out like really smart ways of talking about the fact that they are cool because they are Asian and because there are these other things, right? Um, if that makes any sense. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And it's hard, I mean, Listen, this stuff is hard. This is why people don't do it. And, yeah. and designers don't do it because it's really challenging and difficult. And, and it's easier to reach for the shorthand. It's really easier to reach for the stereotype because that's instantly transmissible, right? Because everyone knows them. Um, and, you know, I usually do this with my class. I won't do this here because it's, you know, too big. But, you know, I'd say like, I guarantee you all of us know all of the stereotypical scripts from our culture about what X, Y, and Z are supposed to be like, what they're supposed to sound like, what they're supposed to do, what they look like, what they what their problems are. And the thing is, just because we we aren't, you know, enacting those scripts doesn't mean they aren't there. And I think that's something that, you know, is difficult to sort of uh, to get through. And even me as a, you know, game master or, or a, a, a person that runs games, like sometimes I have to be mindful of the fact that, you know, in this heat of the moment, I might just like slip into an accent that I don't intend, or I might sort of have to say, okay, let's think through what this actually means or looks like or, or whatever. Awesome. Matthew. Um. So I actually have a question that um, might sound a bit bad because uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, because I don't know how to word it exactly. Okay. Uh, I know, like, I personally am still trying to learn more about um, diversity and mm -hmm. how to include it and um, like when it's appropriate and not. And so you were just saying about talking about colorblindness and I was going to bring in a point about um, the Adventure Zone comic books where multiple of the characters, they're all like many of them are um, of very ethnic, like they have a lot of ethnic, ethnic characters, but it's not focused on their, eth uh, their ethnicity at all. It's focused on the characters themselves. So what would be a good example of a character being amazing because of who they are and their ethnicity? Um, I think in, in popular culture, mainstream culture right now, I would say something like the, the one that I go to immediately is Black Panther, uh, the movie in particular, because I think that film with, it does, you know, it's not perfect, but I think it centers uh, at blackness in a very particular way that is not just about, you know, our stereotypical understandings of what that means, right? Um, and in fact, a lot of it sort of flips some of those scripts around. Now, whether or not audiences are, are able to sort of unpack it or understand it is something that also needs to happen, right? I think that creators often forget that we also have to train our, our our consumers to sort of think through these things too, right? So it's both sides. Um, I don't know if that's a good example. That's the one that sort of comes to mind um, or any of the literatures that I just mentioned where, you know, you have writers who are, you know, so I, I'm, I'm teaching, um, not teaching, I'm leading a book club uh, here locally on Octavia Butler's Kindred, which is a sort of like time travel fantasy novel about a, a black woman from the 70s who uh, is is ripped through time to uh, to uh, slavery era Maryland where she learns that she has to save her uh, white ancestor uh, or she doesn't exist even though that white ancestor you know produces her ancestors through uh, rape and and you know the structures of slavery and that's it's it's really wonderful 
But one of the things that Butler often does in all of her novels is that she centers uh, black and brown women, but doesn't necessarily, you know, make a huge deal of it, except that it's always present and that lens or their perspective is always there. So it's not necessarily like I need to point to the fact that this person is X, Y, and Z identities, but I'm going to show you how those identities actually help us see the world through those, you know, those perspectives or whatever. And maybe that's a different way of thinking about it. If that makes any sense. Actually, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And actually connects to another point I was thinking of because um, I myself have not, um, have, cannot entire, uh, relate to um, ethnic representation, but I um, do um, relate more towards uh, queer representation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my favorite characters and like media, like, um, I'm gonna sound weird, the uh, dating app, the dating game Dream Daddy, I love that one mm -hmm. because of how the characters are portrayed. If they're not portrayed like as the stereotypical gay men, they're just portrayed as people and it's more, it's not who they are. And I think that's one thing that causes a lot of ludo dissonance for me personally is when I see a character on screen and being queer and gay is their whole personality type. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, you know, dimensionality is, again, it's work, right? And when you're dealing with mediums that have these, you know, major channels that have to sort of convey information, I think sometimes, I don't know, like a lot of AAA games are focused on, you know, the visual or sound design or, you know, or whatever, and not necessarily other things. But I think there are ways to do it in smart ways. Again, that goes, it brings me back to representation as like, do we want, do we want realism in terms of like photographic or or scopic representation or is representation more complicated um, and can be you know shorthanded in certain or not shorthanded but like you know we can use abstraction as a way to get at some more complicated ideas one of my favorite video games of all time is no longer available is uh, Merrick Hofas's Limb which um, I don't you can get YouTube video playthroughs of it but you literally are a flashing square of like different colors and you're moving through a little maze and there are other squares that are different colors that you know if you're not the same color as them they attack you um, but if you're the same you can press a button and you can turn their color and you can walk by them, you know float by them and non-representational at all but deeply representational of things like you know um, social pressure or being othered or having to pass or you know, certain kinds of um, uh, uh, identity-based violence, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so I think, I think that's the thing is that, you know, we have to broaden our toolboxes for how to do things. And sometimes the reach for realism, I think really undercuts a lot of that work, especially in fantasy. Like I've noticed over the years that all of our fantasy products, right, or all of our fantasy projects um, are moving more and more towards realism as some marker of it being good or smart or literary or whatever. And I'm really interested in like that choice because I think, and that's a genre problem. I think people didn't take fantasy seriously because it was genre fiction or a genre film or whatever. And so, you know, the gold standard in literature or the gold standard in art is realism, right? Like the idea that if you can describe the world as it is, and um, then somehow you've captured something that, you know, that, you know, is important. And I think fantasy is trying to do that in ways that um, create problems that, you know, need to be, you know, dealt with or, or thought through. I'm not sure. I'm just sort of rambling about that, but um, uh I'm going to move on. If, if, is that okay, Matthew? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you for uh, talking about all that. <laughs> of course. Uh, Eric. Um, I just You're feel like, uh, what is it? Transmedia storytelling, I think, at least for AAA sphere, is like the way to go in terms of representation. Like, I feel like as games become more and more like, uh, as games of service become more and more 
for uh, prevalent business models and as like especially a competitive sphere as uh what about those what light up puzzles the where competitive one, nature of certain video games like, become yeah, more and more pivotal to their like, uh, how, those, like what is ability to survive some, long term uh um, games are slowly like losing their narrative all. side or at least the what is it um, venue i guess to like yeah, express so, their like narrative aspect like, and uh, what is it that runs the risk of like losing the venue for representation in my opinion and a lot of triple a's like at least that's a trend right now is that they're like pivoting more towards uh, transmedia approaches like uh what is it releasing you know side comics novels uh, cinematics and so on to like flesh out the world and stuff like yeah, that yeah. but yeah. i think uh i think the rep key for me for representation isn't necessarily like just the idea or like just one piece of media at this point is enough you have to make sure that like if you're trying to represent something then it's continuous and it's a pivotal part of someone's character so what what like you can't just uh i call this uh throwing a bone at the queer community like you can't just throw us a bone and expect us to be happy for three years like right. that's well, not that's, gonna happen it's tokenism right it's, yeah so i think I, I think what's interesting is like the i think the transmedia experience i think is really can be really powerful and useful um, but I also see it as a way, especially for video games, um, to sidestep actually trying to integrate these kinds of characters, nor, uh, star uh, character stories, um, and, and even mechanics into games, right? So I work in queer game studies, and I work in thinking about the ways games, can games be queer? Um, the answer, of course, is yes, but I do think there is a sort of provocation um, uh, my, my book, which hopefully will, you know, be done this year, um, you know, begins with this provocation, right, that, you know, this book is looking for algorithmic queerness, and what that means is it's really easy to add a character or add a romance plot or add, you know, um, uh, a story that's out, you know, that transmedia story outside about Tracer and, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, in uh, what is that game? My brain just not working today. Oh, um, yeah, like uh, that's, Overwatch. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then you're like, why silo that outside of the game, right? Mm -hmm. So what's left in the game is still the same stuff that hasn't changed. And so is there a way to think about games that really thinks both narratively and also mechanically as being queer, right? Um, and that's that's a bigger problem and you'll have to get my book to try to answer. Yeah, like, uh, what is more established a franchise gets, the harder it becomes so, to like so actually possible. implement, especially, I'm just gonna know. speak about queerness. Queerness in games like Overwatch and League being the most like egregious okay. examples of them, especially Overwatch, I think. Um, but there are signs of hope. I think like, you know, Apex Legends uh, being like very proactive in like updating in-game voice lines on like at the same time with like all their transmedia storytelling and that uh that storytelling like being very heavily focused around queerness is like one good yeah. example the thing i would add to that though is that these are this is great but like you know does that queerness actually impact the game does that queerness actually matter in a way that's not just um you know all the characters the same regardless of what their race is gender is you know, gender presentation, sexuality, right. all this sort of stuff. And yes, it's really hard to do because, you know, we've just had this sort of explosion, especially around Dungeons and Dragons about like, you know, getting rid of racial stats, for example, right? Um, or or uh, limits to stats because of race, gender, or whatever. 
um, because we don't want to be like, this is about quantifying certain kinds of biometrics. But at the same time, I think there are ways to think through, you know, the fact that, you know, this character has an experience and a perspective that might actually change the way you understand how the world works or the, the play works. Or, you know, that's much more complicated, obviously. In AAA games, this is, this is yeah. about millions of like, dollars here. Yeah. Right. The What is it? The like triple a's often have to take the route uh, approach of like uh how should i express, express this um triple a's often take the route of playing a queer game instead of emphasizing queer play right right and the other thing is like you know uh, you know this is the other part back to the sort of question about how do we change this like i think it really is about also getting makers and creators and people in the, in the door so that these systems can also change at that level too um but you know i think we can we can need, we need to also realize that like just because you know the, the company doesn't want to spend the money or risk the money or you know risk profit or whatever that's also something we can press against too like just because you know if it's wrong or if it's not just or if it's not diverse then you know we need to make sure that that we think about that as well i want to move on because we're about to run out of time so i want to make sure we get to more voices and then i have yeah, sorry couple... oh no worries. sorry for taking of... too much of your time Oh, no worries. I, I have a couple of other points to make too that this is all brought up. No, all great. Uh, Daniel. Oh, um, I just had a question on if there are sort of these like issues with these systems within games that sort of have these, I guess, unintentional uh, correlations with like reality that may not be necessary for the game to function so for example the fantasy races in dnd as just being analogs for different cultures or ethnicities in the real world and how would you suggest like a way to implement these types of systems in games or would you say that these are not necessarily like these don't have to exist in games if they don't serve like a thematic purpose like hmm you asked that again not so like i'm unsure on how um you would qualify whether a system is doing representation in like a tasteful way for example okay. if you were to do something that is more like um like the base, uh so we had a lecture from last week um if i remember correctly with uh jason morningstar mm -hmm. and he was talking about how he did um a game about like refugees and how he sort of changed the setting from like afghanistan to space afghanistan mm -hmm. so he could continue to like thematic message but without having to force the players to sort of having to directly confront these sort of like very heavy issues because that's a lot of demand from mm -hmm. players and so yeah. yeah i mean i think you have to figure out what you want your art to be right like we have plenty of 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 we have plenty of you know things that we make um that will will stare you know the real world in the face and then we have lots of things that analogize right or or uh, uh, use illusion to sort of think through certain things as well. Um, I think it all depends on, you know, it depends on what you want to do. I do think that the idea that if you make Afghanistan in space, or if you make, um, if you make, you know, good and evil, uh, in a fantasy world or whatever, like we, we need to think about like what those layers create, right? Because like, as I said, fantasy race is just race, right? It really is. It's just, it's using exactly the same logics of race that we use in the real world. We've just mapped them onto different bodies, right? Or different identities. And if that fantasy race is just replicating or perpetuating the same problems that are in the real world, then that's something we have to sort of deal with and, and, and handle, right? So if all of the 
you know, fair skinned folk are good and all of the dark skinned folk are bad, then that's something we have to sort of, we do have to reckon with ultimately. Um, so I think, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if I could solve this answer, I would be a bazillionaire, obviously, right? Uh, or solve this problem. But I do think it is about being mindful about, you know, what you're creating and why you're creating. And that's true, I think, you know, if anything, when I write a poem or if I write an essay, like I'm really trying to think through, you can't make everyone happy, but you can, you can try to do, you know, no harm or as little harm as possible, right? If, if that's even a thing. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um, I think it kind of does. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think this is the thing is like my game design philosophy generally is, you know, is some is tends to towards simplicity, even though if you look at my games, they are not simple in, in a lot of ways, but they are really simple in the sense of like, I just want something like this is the thing that I want to, it to do or I want something to do, then how do I get there? And, you know, what are the consequences, what are the benefits of that? And what are the consequences of that? So if you're like, I'm going to set this game in this world where everyone is, you know, a rabbit, okay, cool. But then what happens when you start deciding that these rabbits are X, Y, and Z, and those rabbits are, you know, A, B, and C, are you actually doing something that's actually, you know, recreating some of the same sort of uh, problems, uh, or is it critiquing those problems, right? So think about like, you know, the novel Watership Down or, you know, or Animal Farm or whatever, where you're like, again, the, the illusion is to sort of say, I'm not going to talk directly about these problems, but I'm going to clothe them in this sort of narrative world that hopefully will make it more palatable or more, in, you know, or interesting or whatever. So it's tough. Uh, I'm going to move on to um, uh, T. Hi, Desmond, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, so um, I'm actually in a library, so okay. I'm sorry if I'm a little quiet. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess, yeah, for, for me, I'm just kind of like, um, I guess one of the questions that I had is like, um relevant to like building a fictional world where there's like multiple races you know mm -hmm. because I know like from what I understand of like you know everything we talked about so far like what we want to focus on is capturing like the essence like not necessarily like a literal one-to-one -one translation of real life races but like the essence of what it means to live in a culture and like live in a society but I guess the part where I'm struggling with is like what if you have like multiple races who like live in the society like I don't want to create a one-to-one -one, like ratio of like real life racism but in previous iterations of my world where me and a partner we just kind of like said oh magically everyone's like of the same social standing even if they're different races but that just ended up feeling like inauthentic and flat mm -hmm. but um like I'm not quite sure how we would handle going about multiple races without like just having it straight up feel like real racism and especially like in terms of languages like fictional languages like how can we create fictional languages that are like like, oh yeah, this is a fantasy language, but obviously our understanding of real life language draws upon like real life different languages. Right. Well, I mean, that's, a, I think, again, I, you know, I don't have an easy answer for that other than that you, you know, I don't think you should, I don't think a narrative world should shy away from racism, right? If the narrative world is trying to grapple with racism, I think that's an important thing. But if the real, if the narrative world or the fictional world or the fantasy world is just using racism or oppression, or let's say, you know, you live in a world where there's slavery, if that's just a token to say that the main characters are not bad because they don't do slavery, then you might be using a shorthand as opposed to trying to develop an actual world that has a logic that, you know, is trying to think through the problem of this kind of oppression, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the, that's a diff more, the sort of more troubling or difficult part, right? Um, and I, so I'm, I'm interested in, you know, I mean, I think about something like, you know, uh, Dragon Age where like the elves are oppressed and, 
um, and you're like, why are they oppressed? And why are they the elves? Well, is this because this is a, you know, a, in a human centric world? Um, is this just an attempt to, you know, to play our heartstrings and to use the rhetoric of fantasy slavery or fantasy racism as a way for the player then to be like, I'm not that. I've made decisions where I'm not going to oppress, you know, elves or, you know, whatever. Um, and I think that's the question you have to ask is because a lot of times um, the when we play games, it, it allows us a certain amount of like what Lisa Nakamura would call identity tourism, right, where we can sort of be things that we are not. Um, but sometimes, like, especially if you are the unmarked or the ideal citizen subject, if you're straight, white, male, cisgender, able-bodied, educated, you know, all that sort of stuff that if you're like, ooh, one day I'm going to be, you know, a geisha, and the next day I'm going to be um, a runaway slave, and the next day I'm going to be a Martian, like, there are people who don't ever, can't ever escape their sort of identities and embodiments, and I think, I don't know. That's not an answer. The answer is the, you know, to do the work and to just sort of say, not necessarily get lost in the weeds of like trying to rationalize everything. Cause I think sometimes, you know, when you're done writing your novel or your story or your, your game, you just have to go back through and say, what is this doing? And is it actually contributing to the kinds of things that, that, you know, I'm trying to sort of get across if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that does, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on like, you know, I think about world building a lot. And I think the best thing that everyone can do right now is to to read stuff and play stuff that that is way outside of your own experiences or likes or or um, understanding, because I think that's the best way to sort of really not to like I'm going to steal from this or I'm going to base this on what I just read, but to try to say, how does this world actually understand race or how does this world actually understand gender? Um, and I think that's that gets me to my last point just in the last few minutes uh, is to think about ways like, um, so the, the sort of like the other side of the coin of representation is identification, right? This idea that when you play something or read something or watch a movie or watch a cartoon or whatever, at some point you're supposed to be able to identify with someone that's on the screen or in the text or, or you know, I hate this word relatable, uh, it makes me crazy, um, mainly because I think it's, it, it becomes kind of like advertising shorthand for like, this is capturing people because they can sort of connect to it in some way that makes them want to buy our product or click, you know, like, or, you know, whatever. But I think this idea that sometimes we want our media to be about identifying with that media is a trap also. Just like, just like immersion is a trap, I think identification is a trap. This is not to say that you shouldn't watch something and be like, I really love this and I really relate to this character. You know, I just watched Encanto and I can't like get it out of my head, not because, you know, I'm Colombian or Latinx, but because like that level of generational trauma is something I really understand, right? Um, and I'm really interested in like those sort of, you know, those sort of cross, um, uh, cross sort of cultural sort of moments. But sometimes like, I think we need to sort of be better at like playing stuff and reading stuff that's not for us and being okay with that. Right, and, and recognize that I'm gonna read this novel and I might not identify with anybody in it and that's okay. Or I'm gonna play this game and I'm not gonna really understand everything that's going on in it, but that's okay. And then you seek out, you know, people that can help you, you know, think through these ideas and, and such. So that's my last point, I know we're, coming to the end here, but T, did you have more or is that a legacy hand? Oh, uh, it's a little bit of a legacy hand, but I guess okay. like just, um, just like identification, not on a literal level, but kind of like on like an emotional level and understanding that other people might identify with things in different ways. Sure, sure. And you know, that's not, it's not, I mean, I think that's the thing is like, uh, um, one of my favorite novels of all time is Toni Morrison's Beloved, right, which is, you know, amazing and powerful and magical and rich and deeply, 
you know, uh, visceral and traumatic and all these sorts of things. And I would never say about that novel that I identify, right? Or I relate. I can say I can I can em empathize, right? Or I can sort of try to sort of understand what's going on. Um, I've been on this big kick right now where, you know, we often like to say when someone says like something happened, bad happened to them, you say, oh, I can't imagine what that must be like for you. Or if you say, oh, you know, you're not, you're not white or you're not queer or you're not whatever, you, you would say, oh, I can't imagine what that must be like for you. I think we should flip that back around to, I think you need to imagine, try, not understand, right? Not know, right? But you have to try to imagine what this other person is going through in order for empathy to actually happen. So what if we thought about games as, as not representation and identification engines, but as empathy engines? Um, and then there's lots of writing about like whether games can even be, you know, create or, or teach empathy, um, all that sort of stuff. So that's, a, that's for another day. Um, but I think there is something in there. And all of these questions, I think all of you are sort of trying to tease through you know, I want this thing to do a thing. And maybe it's about trying to figure out like what it's not doing or what we should be doing instead, or, you know, I don't know. There's a lot going on. How much time do we have left, Aaron? Seven minutes? Yeah, we have seven minutes and three questions. Okay, so quick, quick, Sebastian. <laughs> uh, hi, hello. So um, I'm Latino, specifically a Mexican, and I'd absolutely love to see representation of my culture. However, when it comes to a fantasy setting, I think it's a bit difficult not only to represent Mexicans, but the Latina community as a whole, primarily since we can't really be categorized, so to speak. So how exactly can we approach representing multiracial communities such as mine in a fantasy setting? I mean, maybe not to try. I don't know. I mean, I think that's the thing, you know, as, as, a, as a Taiwanese American, Chinese American, you know, Asia gets painted with huge broad strokes, right? Um, in a lot of ways. And I think like, um, I think, again, like if you're going to do it, you have to do the work, right? And that's getting actual uh, uh, community members in the room or really sort of trying to think through like, what is it that you're trying to do with that? Um, but otherwise, you know, if it's fantasy, why does it have to be that, right? Um, or, you know, if you're going to write um, from a particular cultural perspective, then, you know, try to you know, use one that is, it, that's your own or whatever. I don't know. I'm, I think that's, that's, I don't have an answer for that other than to do the work, if that makes oh, sense. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah, it's a bit <laughs> tricky. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. I think we're getting creators now who are willing to sort of try, right? And, and um, there is a movement in a sense of kind of like, you know, the idea that, you know, Latinx doesn't, is, is this umbrella term, but sometimes if, it, we can think of this sort of as a sort of pan, you know, cultural sort of movement where you're kind of like trying to represent particular, you know, vibes of a thing rather than necessarily like this is about being accurate to, you know, one thing. Because even if you're like saying, oh, this is set in a sort of futuristic or a fantasy version of, of Mexico or wherever, like that's a huge place that has all sorts of, you know, much smaller little, you know, cultural ecosystems. And so I think that's the challenge is, that's the worry is like, if you're really trying to do realism, that comes with its own set of problems, right? Alex. Hi, Edmund, uh, I'll be very quick. Um, I, so you, you've come back to this phrase that I find really fascinating. Um, you know, you see, you come in, you keep coming back to this idea of doing the work. And I think that, you know, when we're having conversations like this, um, I think that there, there's often a sort of a lot of apprehension about that idea of the, doing the work and doing it wrong. And so my question, I think, is, is do you make a distinction in that sort of process of doing the work between, you know, on the one hand, the kind of sort of public facing design work that you, that you do a lot of, and, and maybe the kind of more, you know, and I know, you know, I, I'm, I'm very much with you on, the, on there being no magic circle, but are we, you know, can we think about the work that goes on in our sort of private play groups or in our own sort of world building as maybe more enclosed or, you know, like, sure. you, I guess I don't want to, I don't want to leave the question, but do you make a distinction there? 
I don't make a distinction. Maybe we can, you know, well, the world loves a spectrum, so or uh, you know, a, a scale. So maybe it's just it's on a on a spectrum of like how how porous or not porous you want your game circle to be. Because you know, for the longest time, my tabletop gaming communities, I was the only person of color. And to date, I think in most of my circles, I am the only queer person. So, um, and then so, and a queer person of color. And so like a lot of times my negotiation of like what play looks like um, is not like always, you know, I, there were definitely a number of years during like college, grad school where I was always the guy that's like, that's super racist or that's super, you know, homophobic or that's super sexist and my friends were just like come on we just want to play right um and you know people have grown up and 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 they've done their own you know inventory work and and we've worked it out um but i do think that you know it's it's all of our responsibilities and not just the person that's on you know at the margin or at that doesn't have that you know ma major identity or whatever that has to sort of do all that work for everybody you know in in that but um i don't know if that answers your question um i think oh, this is the thing make good a good faith effort i think is always better like i'm more i'm more I'm more interested in people trying and messing up and being willing to be told that they mess up and then learning from it than to be like, I'm going to make this perfect and then you can't tell me anything about it, right? Because that seems really insane and not possible, right? Even, even in community members get, you know, make mistakes too, right? So again, like if you're like, I'm an indigenous writer, like that's a huge swag of lots of different groups and places and, and histories, right? And so, you know, but maybe we give them a little bit more leeway because this is something that's not, you know, being represented really well. All right, last but not least, uh, Adriana. Hi, Edmund. I'm I'm Aaron's PhD student. I'm one of the TAs for this class, and awesome. uh, it's really nice to meet you. And I and I, at some point, you mentioned empathy machines, and this is probably a discussion far too broad and specific for the purposes of this class. But I, I would love to hear your take on it. Um, on so which one? Of, uh, you mentioned empathy machines briefly. Oh, yes. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I, right now I'm working on a project about The Last of Us 2 and how they did or didn't do queerness through like no fun and ludonarrative dissonance. And kind right. of what's, what started a lot of that was thinking about empathy machines um, as, you know, The Last of Us Part 2 was one of the first yeah. games to center queerness in that way. Um, but it, there was something about it that kept bugging me because I ended up really not liking the game. Um, and it, it was kind of that idea of like, well, you want someone to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, right? To empathize with them. But when you do that, when you walk a mile in someone else's shoes, you've effectively stolen their shoes. Right. Yeah. Um, I hate that phrase. I don't use it. <laughs> You're right. Um, and I, but I like to apply that to the idea of like having a game's goals be empathy. Um, Anyways, and I just, I like, it's an ongoing complicated discussion and I kind of just wanted to hear you talk about it a little well, bit. Well, I just made up <laughs> empathy machine, so trademark. Um, no, <laughs> I, I, I think the empathy machine is us. It's not the computer ultimately in a lot of ways. I think the, I think the game or the movie or the novel can, can set up, tee us up, right? Um, I forgot the, there are a number of, uh, of scholars that you know, I can't remember the person. It's either Todd Harper or maybe it's Alien Zimmerman or whoever. Like, you know, games are designed experiences, right? Um, and I extend that by saying most of the time games are normative designed experiences, right? As you are sort of encountering. Um, and so, well, can we design for empathy? I don't know. I mean, someone like Jane McGonagall would be like, yes, of course. Uh, but I think it's more complicated than that. I think games that attempt to design empathy in the walk a mile in my shoes vein, in that identification and representation vein, I think are always doomed to fail. Um, because who gets to project themselves into those shoes are usually people who already can uh, who have the power and privilege to to uh, take on identities at will, right? Um, and so I think that's the thing. Again, I sort of go back to like, what if we teach ourselves to like think about empathy as like trying to work through something that's really not about us, but trying to figure out connections or bridges or 
or free songs or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. That's This is a new thing for me because I'm trying to sort of think through this um, as well, you know, yeah. And with that, I think we're at time. So I'm going <laughs> to, I don't want to, to keep um, ending uh, end longer than I have to. Um, no worries. But um, I do have yeah. a meeting. At, I have a late, super late meeting in 10 minutes, but I can hang out for a couple of seconds. Not but a uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to turn the camera off, but uh, let's all give Ed a huge round of applause um, before he goes. Thank you so much for, for bringing the knowledge and being so generous of with your course. thoughts, your history, your time. Um, it's just so wonderful to hear you going through all of this. And it made me think in so many ways also. Um, all right. You're welcome to reach out to me.